All right. Um, so I'll talk. Uh, there's two parts of my talk, or three parts. Uh, so one is about a little bit of kind of state of the art of supervised learning reinforcement learning, and uh, and then the second part about self supervised learning, and that's the title really of uh, of the talk. Um, and uh, with an introduction to something I call energy based learning, which is sort of a, a way of sort of a general framework or paradigm if you want to approach um, uh, to approach learning in general. Should I use this? All right, much better. Oh, this is just for recording, I guess. Um, OK. So we all know what supervised learning is about. Uh, I'm told you all know what supervised learning is about. <laughs> um, and this is the situation where you train a machine by telling it what the correct answer is for a bunch of uh, training samples. And this works really well if you have lots of data. It works for image recognition, translation, natural language processing. Um, speech recognition, you know, all kinds of applications, but those are applications where the economics are such that it's worth actually labeling a lot of data by hand. Um, and, and of course, uh, you know, in that context, uh, machine learning is basically comes down to finding a good form for a parameterized function, uh, preferably differentiable, at least almost everywhere, in such a way that by using a uh, gradient descent type algorithm, you can tune the parameters to optimize the performance of the system. Right? So if everything is differentiable or almost differentiable, uh, you can optimize using gradient or subgradient, and, uh, and it all works. We all know about that. And there is you know, guarantees of uh, generalization if the capacity of the machine is limited. There's, of course, another form of learning which I'm not going to talk about very much. Um, uh, called re reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning has seen a lot of uh, success over the last uh, several years. Uh, this success are almost all um, uh, kind of restricted to games or virtual environments. There are also applications of reinforcement learning in situations where you can collect lots of data really quickly to, to have like, you know, really fast uh, uh, adaptation. So if you are, uh, um, you know, you want to control uh, um, you want to show people content and you want to kind of figure out you know, where, you, where you want to rank the content. There is no differentiable objective function because you don't know what people are gonna, are gonna do. So you can use whether they click on a piece of content or not as kind of a reinforcement and then uh, optimize the, the policy as to what you show to people uh, to, maximize the, to maximize that. Um, but these are you know, only situations where, where you get lots and lots of feedbacks. And otherwise, uh, it works for games because you can get machines to, to, uh, to play games really quickly. And so, you, so they can play millions of games per, you can run it in parallel on, on lots of computers. And so you can train machines to play Atari games, to play Go, to play StarCraft, uh, Dota, you know, whatever, uh, all kinds of games. And it's only due to the fact that you can run those games faster than real time on many machines. If the machine had to run at the same speed as uh, as we do, we, which means real time, uh, play the games in real time, it basically wouldn't be practical. It would take about 80 hours for the best uh, current algorithms to learn to play a single Atari game to a level of performance that a human can reach in about 15 minutes. So the efficiency, the sample efficiency of this type of reinforcement learning is horrible, uh, compared to humans at least. Uh, for Go, um, so the, you probably heard of AlphaGo, AlphaGo Zero from, from DeepMind. Um, where the, the details are not fully released and there is no open source code. There is uh, a system called Elf Open Go, which was released by Facebook. Uh, and this one, uh, you can just download and run uh, or train it yourself. And it's used by a lot of uh, different people who are interested in this. Uh, this one required about 20 million self-play games uh, running on 2,000 GPUs for two weeks to, uh, to reach superhuman performance. So this is not cheap in terms of computation, as you can tell. Uh, if you were to, to buy this on a, on a you know, cloud computing server, it would cost you a couple million bucks. Um, and, uh, uh, and it, you know, it's more games that, you know, a single person can play in a lifetime, probably more than all of humanity has played in a, in a number of years. Uh, there's a very uh, interesting uh, uh, paper recently by DeepMind uh, by Oriol Vineyard's group, uh, um, AlphaStar. Uh, which plays a, a single map on StarCraft with a, a single type of player. And uh, the training for this took the equivalent of 200 years of real-time real -time play, which is definitely more than any single StarCraft player has been able to do. 
uh, there's no paper on this uh, as far as I can tell yet. Um, so they all use you know, deep architectures. They all use conventional nets, actually, uh, with a combination of other things, transformers and StarCraft in particular. But as you can tell, in terms of simple efficiency, it's very bad. And it's a huge problem because what that means is that we can't really use reinforcement learning for uh, other than in simulation to train real world systems like a car that drives itself or a robot that grabs objects unless you have a room full of robots you know, training all day. Um, so if you were to use reinforcement learning at the moment to train a car to drive itself, um, it would have to you know, drive itself for millions of hours and cause tons and tons of accidents and, uh, and, and it, it's just not practical, right? So people do it in simulation, it kind of works. Simulators are not very accurate, so there is a problem of sort of transferring from simulation to the real world. There's got to be the work on this. But there's a big mystery there, which I'll come back to in the second half of the talk. And uh, the mystery is, is how is it that humans can learn to drive a car in about 20 hours of training without causing any accident? And the, the sort of preview of, of the answer to this is that we have internal predictive models of the world that allows us to predict that if we drive ne near a cliff and we turn the wheel to the right, uh, the car is going to run off a cliff and because of gravity is going to fall and nothing good is going to come out of it. We don't need to actually try it to predict this. And so perhaps the answer is for eventually machines to learn to to learn to have those predictive models of the, of the world that will allow them to predict the consequences of, your act, of their actions before, before they occur and plan, plan ahead. And to some extent, we can say that the essence of intelligence is the ability to predict. Uh, but for now, let's stick with uh, supervised learning. So uh, I'm sure, uh, so who, is, uh, who doesn't know what a conventional net is? Don't be shy. OK, that's great. I can skip a lot of stuff. Um, OK, so a conventional net, of course, is an architecture that is, is designed to uh, you know, recognize images. But in fact, it's designed to recognize array data, where the property is that there is strong local correlations in the, in the, in the features and, uh, and uh, um, some sort of uh, translation invariance of the statistics of the signal. So it's true for images. It's true for audio signals. Is true for basically anything that comes to you in the form of an array where the locality in the array has some meaning. Um, and of course, you know, the first applications of this were on character recognition, but we quickly realized that we could recognize multiple objects with those things, not just single objects, but kind of scanning, if you want, or doing the equivalent of scanning a conventional net on the, on the big image, um, which, of course, you don't have to do it stupidly because um, since all the layers are convolution, you don't actually need to explicitly recompute the conventional net at every location. You just make each layer bigger, and then you, you know, make every layer a convolution. Uh, people rename this fully convolutional nets afterwards, but it's just convolutional nets. Um, and uh, when you apply this to natural images, you can, you know, you can train systems like this to detect uh, objects in natural images. Uh, you can apply them locally. You can apply a convolutional net. Uh, locally to an image to have it label every pixel in the image um, with, for example, the category of, of the object it belongs to. And the conventional nets has some sort of, you know, each output of the network has some sort of window of influence on the input, which in this case is actually quite large. Um, so to, to the side of the category of a single pixel, the, 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 the network here looks at a, a wide contextual window around this pixel and, uh, and then gives you an output for that particular pixel. And, and this is done sort of convolutionally, so it's very cheap. Um, this was a system that was built about 10 years ago, and it could run at about uh, 30 frames per second on a, on a specialized hardware, actually, an FPGA. Um, and of course, what, what you probably all know is that around 2012, 2013, uh, those networks started you know, beating uh, other methods for object recognition for, by a large margin, largely due to the fact that the data sets became, became bigger. Those systems are pretty hungry in terms of data, more than whatever methods people were, were, were using before. Um, and so the appearance of things like data sets like ImageNet of, you know, sort of made it possible to sort of really exploit the, the capacity in those, uh, in those networks. And then the second thing was the availability of GPUs, which allowed to run those systems really quickly. 
but you all know this. And what you all know also is that there's been an inflation in the number of layers used in, in those networks over the, over the years where you know, some of the workhorse of image recognition nowadays is uh, you know, some sort of uh, backbone convolutional net similar to ResNet, for example. So ResNet uh, is a convolutional net where every pair of layers, I mean, a block, a re re um, residual block, I'm sure, again, many of you have heard of this, but you basically have pairs of layers, uh, convolution, nonlinearity, convolution. Sometimes you have uh, uh, subsampling or pooling as well, uh, but this one, this one doesn't. And then you have some sort of uh, uh, connection that kind of skips pairs of layers. And so essentially, what you, you, you can think of the function of one of those blocks as basically computing the identity function. And those, uh, those, those layers compute the deviation of the function of that layer from the identity. Uh, so that sounds kind of uh, a waste to just have a layer that computes the identity function. And it is. In fact, many of the layers in those systems don't do much. You can kind of get rid of them, actually, after, after training. Um, but what it does is that it makes the system sort of fault-tolerant, uh, if you want. So if the learning algorithm somehow kind of gets into a situation where some layers die, which can happen, it's not catastrophic because you always have the information going through the, the bypass connection. Um, and so that you know, pair of layers just you know, um, kind of checks itself out of the network that so is, not, is not used. Uh, but it doesn't kill the entire, the entire effort. So that's one of the advantages of ResNet. You can, you can think of the, the long succession of layers as sort of progressively refining the, the answer and cleaning up the, the, the output or the, the representation. And there's been variations of this where you have you know, skipping connections that skip multiple layers, et cetera. That's called dense, dense net. Um, so I'm sure a lot of people will talk, you know, talk to you about progress in computer vision over the next few years, and there's been a huge amount of progress uh, over the last few years um, with things like Mascar CNN, which is sort of a two-pass uh, image recognition system that, that can uh, pick out every instance of every object in an image um, and with you know, really good performance. So there's sort of a, a, first, uh, a first few layers that kind of identify regions of interest and then you kind of apply a second neural net to the convolutional net to the, the regions of interest that have been identified by the first one. Um, there's also kind of one-pass systems uh, that my colleague at in Menlo Park at Facebook used the, you know, called RetinaNet or Feature Pyramid Network. And you can think of this as, um, let's say you want to produce a dense map of uh, everything that's in the image. So for every pixel in the input, you want to give a, a category of an instance or, uh, or, or a category. Uh, whether it's an object or kind of a background uh, region, if you want. And so you have you know, a bunch of layers of a convolutional net where the spatial resolution goes down as you go up because of, of subsampling. Uh, and then you have sort of a similarly architected network that kind of goes the other way from low resolution to high resolution. You have kind of skipping connections that go from one map in the, in the sort of uh, you know, abstraction pyramid, if you want, um, to the corresponding map in the output, uh, uh, you know, the part of the network that produces the output. And you can train this end to end uh, with sort of weakly supervised uh, uh, architectures. You can uh, plug classifiers uh, taking inputs from sort of various levels in the, in the network. Um, and this works amazingly well. So uh, this is a result from Ascar CNN, actually, not from the Retina Net or Future Pyramid Network, but its results are quite similar. Uh, you can get every instance of every object outlined uh, uh, together with a box. So the, the colors are actually produced by the network and correspond to, to categories. Um, and you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing how, how well this works. Uh, you need data. Uh, these are results from this uh, sort of single pass feature pyramid network. Uh, again, the colors indicate sort of individual objects, but this system actually labels not just the object, but also the background regions. So it's sort of, uh, they call this panoptic uh, vision. 
Um, so these, these type of architectures, we have sort of a, a conventional net with decreasing resolution, followed by another one with sort of increasing resolution, which some people call deconvolutional net. There's a paper from, uh, uh, I guess, 2012 or so, or 11, by uh, my colleague Rob Fergus on, on this idea of deconvolutional net. Um, and uh, uh, this architecture is used quite a lot in image segmentation, particularly for applications in uh, medical image uh, analysis. And some people call this kind of architecture a UNet because of the of the shape when you represent it this way. Uh, so it's exact, you know, very very much the same idea I showed before, except now the the layers of the kind of feedforward uh, part of the network are kind of drawn on this side, and then the the sort of resolution increasing half is drawn on that side with skipping connections going uh, directly. So it looks like a U, and it's sort of vari variations of this. Um, so this is work from uh, my colleagues at, uh, at NYU who are working on with medical uh, image analysis. Uh, these are uh, 3D MRI scans. Um, so the convnet here is three-dimensional. The convolutions uh, take place in three dimensions over the, the three special dimensions. And, um, and every uh, uh, voxel now is labeled as you know, one of a number of categories. So you can do things like uh, segment, um, uh, bones and things like this for you know preparing for hip replacement surgery and stuff like that and uh, and it works really it works much better if you use uh, 3d rather than 2d because you get the consistency of all the slices so what you see at the top here is there are artifacts of the recognition if you use kind of uh, uh, 2d segmentation uh, perhaps with a little bit of cleanup and if you use 3d you, you sort of get way fewer of those artifacts um, the same team with a different subset of people has applied this to uh, things like mammograms. So this is 2D data, but you have multiple images from sort of multiple views, uh, angles of view. Um, and uh, here is a surprising thing. So this is a kind of application that you, some of you may not have heard of, uh, which is the uh, application of convnets in physics. Uh, this is an example in astrophysics. So this is a, a paper from... Uh, I think it was in PNAS, published in PNAS a few months ago from the Flatiron Institute, which is a private research institute in, uh, in New York. Uh, and what they did here was uh, use a, a convolutional net to accelerate the solution of partial differential equations uh, solvers. So what they're interested in, these are cosmologists, and they're interested in you know, what are the initial conditions of you know, baby universe that will cause the kind of universe we're observing today. And what you have to do for that is basically simulate the entire universe at its birth you know, the expansion, the fast expansion phase of the, of the universe. And you can do this because you could do this in principle because, you know, you have the density of matter and dark matter, ordinary matter, dark matter, photons, whatever, at every location. And you can solve a partial differential equation, which basically is just, a, you know, physics uh, at every location and, uh, and kind of compute the evolution of the universe this way. The problem of, with this is that if you want to do this at the scale of the universe, uh, given the size of the, the grid, set, the grid that you have to use to solve this equation, it will take too long. And so um, what they did here was um, they used one of those uh, solvers, known PDE solvers, uh, to kind of solve those equations on kind of small domains, small four-dimensional domains, right? Because it's three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. Uh, and they train a convolutional net to produce the same result. Uh, but that convolutional net uh, has a bigger grid, right? So a PDE solver basically takes uh, one value, one voxel, okay, four-dimensional voxel if you want, uh, or three-dimensional voxel, and then looks at the neighbors and then passes it through some function that computes the new value for the next time step, let's say, of, uh, uh, of the, the, central, the, the central grid cell. So it's a convolution-like operation, except that, you know, it's maybe nonlinear. Uh, so, so what they did was train a convolutional net with a... Uh, a few layers, and they, it, it, you use this, it uses this UNet architecture, so it can take a fairly large uh, context into account, uh, not just the neighboring cells, but sort of a bigger uh, neighborhood, rather big grid cells, and it's trained to produce the result that the PDE solver would, would produce, and they can easily generate data by running the PDE solver, but they run it on kind of small 3D domains. And then once they have this convolutional net, 
they, they can run it on the, the big scale of, you know, universe-size universe size scale, if you want. And, uh, and what they get is uh, those kind of maps here, which are sort of displacement maps of, of densities. And, and these are sort of different methods. Uh, and the colors indicate errors. Blue is low error, and you know, red is high error. And those are sort of various ways of doing this. And this is kind of their proposed method. Um, and uh, compared with what the PDE solver would do for a relatively small domain. So that's going to be an inter interesting thing, which is to, to use uh, neural nets or deep learning in general as a phen phenomenological model of something that we might possibly know the underlying physics, but it's computationally too expensive. People are doing this also for uh, predicting the properties of materials for uh, solving uh, problems in molecular dynamics. So for example, conformation of protein, whether two proteins are gonna stick to each other, you know, things like that, which is of course super important for things like drug design. Um, I was at Harvard uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I talked to people who are trying to use neural nets to predict the property of uh, certain solids. So if you take graphene, which is sort of a two-dimensional mesh of uh, carbon uh, atoms, and you take, um, and it's you know, just a single atom thick, uh, uh, layer, you take two layers of graphene, and the one on top, you twist it just a little bit compared to the, the one at the bottom. There's a particular angle at which this material becomes superconductor, and nobody has any idea why. And so there's some idea of using neural nets to kind of build phenomenological models of, of those properties so that perhaps we could predict uh, other properties. There's um, interesting work along those lines also by uh, Pascal Fouard, who is actually originally a vision guy, at uh, a PFL, and what he's doing, what he's been doing was to um, predict the aerodynamic or hydrodynamic properties of a solid uh, using a, by training a convolutional net, a 3D convolutional net, basically. So you feed the shape of the, the solid to the, to the system, and again, using fluid dynamics uh, computation to generate data, you train it to produce the, the properties of that shape. For example, it's drag or lift, if you are interested in designing airfoils uh, for, for you know, blades of propellers or airplanes or hydrofoils or whatever. Um, and then what you have now is a neural net that predicts those properties. And so because it's a neural net is differentiable, so now you can optimize the shape by doing gradient descent in input space. You can optimize the shape so as to get the properties you want uh, on the output, which you, you, know, you can't really do if, with a regular computational fluid dynamics uh, piece of code. So it's really interesting. He actually has a startup that works on this. Yes. Uh-huh. Well, I guess you have to really know the underlying physics to be able to make that generalization. So, I mean, you can test on relatively small spatial domain because you can run the, the PDE solver. So you know how accurate your, your comnet is. The question is, when you extend the size, is it still accurate, okay? And there is a leap of faith. There's no question. Um, now, to your comment that this has nothing to do with conventional net, no, it does. It has very, very much to do with conventional net because all of those PDEs are local operations that basically look like convolutions that are essentially the same, uh, you know, plus some nonlinear thing because, you know, if you do a uh, Navier-Stokes equation for fluid dynamics, you have to do some projection afterwards, that's nonlinear, but, um, uh, you know, but it's, it's a local operation and it's the same operation you do everywhere in the image, so, or everywhere in the, in the volume, so it is a convolutional net. I mean, it's, it's directly, um, it's probably one of the most appropriate use of convolutional net you can imagine. Um, 
So, of course, there's been uh, quite a bit of progress in, in things like, uh, you know, self-driving cars. It's a uh, work in progress. Uh, these are actually videos that are quite a few years old, I think about five years, five years old. Uh, from, uh, this one is from uh, Mobileye, which is now Intel and uh, NVIDIA. And there's a huge amount of work on self-driving cars, as you know. A lot of engineering goes into this, but all the perception systems use, uh, you know, some sort of comnet to process either images from cameras or from uh, various other types of sensors like LiDAR and other things like this. Um, okay, so all of this is great. Uh, it's all supervised and reinforcement. And one big question that we can ask ourselves is, is this gonna take us to the possibility of building you know, truly intelligent machines? Uh, machines where that, you know, I'm not talking about human level intelligence, but maybe intelligence of a house cat or something like that. So a house cat has more common sense than any AI systems that we build, that we can build today? And the answer is no, we need, we need you know, significant kind of conceptual progress if you really, if you really wanna make uh, machines that are more intelligent than we have today. So we can do all the stuff we have on the, on the left, assuming that we put enough efforts in them, uh, engineering efforts, like you know, safer cars, you know, semi-autonomous cars, uh, better medical image analysis systems, you know, all kinds of stuff. Stupid chatbots, you know, that are entertaining. Um, but we can't have things that, you know, we, we, the technology we have is not enough to get machines that have common sense to get, to build things like intelligent personal assistants that really help us, in, can help us in our daily lives answer any question we have and, you know, kind of uh, be a bit more like, like human assistants. Uh, we can have really smart chatbots. Uh, we can have household robots that you know take care of all the chores in the house. Uh, we don't really have agile and dexterous robots. They they are agile and dexterous in very kind of specific situations, but it's sort of very brittle. And we can't have artificial intelligence. So in general, we can't have artificial in general intelligence because that concept does not exist. There is no such thing as general intelligence. Um, and I hate this term, AGI. Uh, there's a lot of people who claim that you know, they are gonna get to AGI by scaling up reinforcement learning, just having more computation. This is completely false, okay? Those people are after investment, so they're ready to either you know, self, be self-deluded or, or kind of stretch the truth a little bit. Um, but in my opinion, we're not gonna get there with the current type of learning that we are uh, that we're using. Um, and so why is there no such thing as artificial general intelligence? And that's because there is no general intelligence. Human intelligence is incredibly specialized. I'm sorry to say that, okay? That applies to everyone in this room. Um, but our intelligence is super specialized. Um, you know, we're built by, by evolution to kind of survive in our environment. And we have this sort of impression that our intelligence is general but we just suck at a lot of tasks, okay? Um, and in fact, a lot of the tasks that computers can do quite well, we, we totally suck at it. So f there was this idea that, uh, uh, you know, before AlphaGo, AlphaGo Zero, et cetera, uh, that um, humans were the best Go player in the world were very, very close to the ideal player, okay? Um, call it God, right? That uh, you, could, you could get just, uh, a few stones of handicap with the uh, idea player and basically beat the idea player. Two or three stones handicap or something like this. Turns out, no, turns out the best human players are horrible. Uh, you know, current machines are much, much better than they are, like by a huge margin. So we just suck at it, we're, we're really bad. Uh, which means, you know, that's not part of the stuff that evolution kind of built into our, our brain to be able to do well. Um, now the thing is, the reason why people were thinking that you know, they were very close to the ideal player was because they could not imagine uh, you know, smarter, considerably smarter entities. And so we cannot imagine all the stuff that we're not able to do. And therefore we think of ourselves as having general intelligence. It's just that our imagination for what, you know, what functions we need to be able to do is very limited. <clears throat> Um, let me give you another more specific example, uh, slightly more, I wouldn't say mathematical, but slightly more quantitative. Um, 
your, your optical nerve has one million fibers. Um, so imagine we just take the one million fibers coming out of your optical nerve that goes to your brain. And imagine that they're just binary. So what you see is just a binary image, okay? Uh, one million bits. How many, uh, so a particular uh, recognition function, if you want, okay? Recognizing your grandmother or whatever, is a Boolean function of one million bits um, in the input and one bit in the output. And the question is, how many such functions are there? Anyone has any idea how many such functions? How many Boolean functions of one million bits are there? Any suggestion? Any idea? Two to the one million? Yeah, you're off by a huge factor. But it's a good start. Uh, 25, yes. Uh, two to the two to the one million, that's the correct answer. Okay, so you have two to the one million input configuration of one million bits, right? And for each of those two to the one million configuration, you have one output bit. That's the truth table of a particular Boolean function, okay? So the number of configurations of two to the one million bits is two to the two to the one million. It's an unfathomably large number. I mean, it's just a ridiculously large number. Now, among all of those functions, how many do you think, what proportion do you think your brain can actually compute? Your visual cortex. Visual cortex has, you know, order uh, between 10 and, and 100 billion neurons. Uh, order 10 to the 14 synapses, okay. So it has 10 to the 14 synapses. Let's say, to be generous, each synapse can, can uh, store 10 bits. Okay, so that's 10 to the 15 bits in your entire visual cortex. That's, your, that's what determines the function of, your, neuro, of your, uh, your visual cortex. That means the number of functions your visual cortex can possibly uh, implement is two to the 10 to the 15. That's a lot less than two to the two to the one million. Not a lot less, it's just, you know, there's like no comparison, right? One, so the number of functions that your visual cortex can implement compared to all possible functions it's just this tiny, tiny, tiny sliver. We're super specialized. In particular, if I play a trick on you, I cut your optical nerve, I'm gonna do it, uh, okay? And I put a device between your, your retina and your brain that permutes all the pixels in your, in your optical nerve with a random permutation, but a fixed one, okay? So now there is no spatial consistency in the signal you get to your visual cortex. Uh, I don't think you can learn vision because your cortex has local connections and those local connections are there to exploit local correlation and now you break those local correlation by doing this permutation, you can't, you can't see anymore. You might see at very low resolution because the higher layers have big context, but what is it true, what is true? Yes. Okay. So it is retinotopic. So the connection between the, the uh, optical nerve and the visual cortex is retinotopic, which means the topology is preserved. Uh, the connections are largely local. There are long range connections, but there's a, only a small number of them. And so you don't, you don't have a huge amount of you know, communication bandwidth for the long range. Uh, you, you have, you know, big bundles of connections from sort of low layers to high layers, if you want, from V1 to V2 and V2 to V4. Um, and once you get to the higher layers, the, the, the spatial distribution is not represented anymore. It's like a convnet where you are pooling. And so in the high, high layers, you don't need that uh, organization, but by the time you get there, the, the spatial resolution is lost. So we can do the experiment, actually. That would be fun. Okay, so next question is, how do humans and animals uh, learn? Um, so I don't know how many of you were, were here yesterday at the inauguration, probably not many, um, but <coughs> there is this, this idea that humans learn in a very different way from either reinforcement or supervised learning. And I'll call this later self-supervised learning, but this is just a hypothesis. Uh, but if you but, you know, babies learn concepts. They, they learn sort of basic facts about basic knowledge uh, about the world, basically just by observation in the first few weeks and months of life. Um, and Emmanuel Dupou, who is a colleague of 
Jean and me at uh, ONS and, uh, and Facebook uh, put together this chart that shows at what age babies learn different concepts. So things like uh, being able to make the difference between uh, animate and in inanimate object that pops up around three months and the notion of object permanence, the fact that uh, an object that is hidden behind another one is still there, uh, still exists. The notions of solidity, rigidity, uh, stability, and then intuitive physics like uh, gravity, inertia, things like this pop up around eight months. So if you show uh, a, a six months old baby, the scenario on the top left where you put a little car on a, on a platform and you push, up, you push the car off the platform and it doesn't fall. It's hidden in the back, but the baby can see that. It's a trick. Um, six months, they, they're not surprised. They just, you know, so that's, that's how the world works. You know, it's one more thing I need to learn. Uh, after nine months, they've learned that objects are not supposed to float in the air, that they're supposed to fall. And uh, they go like this, okay? And you can measure how long they stare at it and with how much attention. And so that's how you know that a concept has been, has been learned or not. We, we know if, if a concept is, is violated by a particular uh, scene that you show the baby, the baby is gonna be really surprised and you can measure the degree of surprise if you want. So how, how is it that babies learn this? Just basically by observation. You know, young babies, you know, before a few months old are completely helpless. They just observe. They don't really have any way of affecting uh, uh, the physical world around them. So how does that happen? So it's a different type of learning that either reinforcement or supervised learning. And it's not just babies. It's, you know, most animals learn, learn this kind of stuff. This is a baby orangutan. It's being shown a magic trick, whether it's a an object in the cup and the object is removed, but he doesn't see that and now the cup is empty and he's running on the floor laughing. <laughs> um, so obviously, you know, his model of the world includes object permanence and objects are not supposed to disappear like this and, you know, and when we see something that surprises us, we are, you know, we laugh or we get scared because here is something we didn't predict and it can kill us. So there's all kinds of uh, concepts like this. Uh, the reason for this animation here at the top is, is that um, these very basic concepts like the fact that the world is three-dimensional that perhaps we can learn by just training ourselves uh, to predict uh, very simple things. So if I, um, if I train myself, I train my brain or if I train a, a learning machine to predict what the world is gonna look like when I, when I move my, my head or the camera uh, a few centimeters to the left, uh, the view of the world changes depending on um, you know, objects move with parallax motion depending on the depth, uh, the distance to my eyes. And so if I train myself to predict what the world is going to look like when I move the camera, perhaps I can automatically infer that every object in the world has a depth because that's the best explanation for, it's the simplest explanation for how things change. Okay, so the notion of depth, the fact that the world is three-dimensional might just simply emerge from training ourselves to predict what the world looks like when we move our head. Once you have that, you have occlusion edges. Uh, you know, objects that are nearby don't move the same way that objects that are far away. And so you see them as, as objects. Okay, there's a bunch of, you know, sort of weakly supervised uh, vision systems that exploit this, this, kind of, uh, uh, this kind of property. Once you have objects, you know, you have objects that can, they can move independently of others. You have background objects, you have, you know, the notion of obstacle, you know, things like that, localization. So you could think of, you know, concepts like this being sort of built hierarchically um, by just training yourself to predict and then representing, you know, coming up with good representations of, that allow you to do a good job at predicting. Okay, so this is not supervised. It would be a non-supervised form of learning. Um, and that led uh, some of us to so this is uh, a joke from Elias Air Force. Um, it's a play on some poem from the 1960s or 70s. The revolution will not be supervised. Uh, so the, the future is in a new form of learning that would allow machine to accumulate all those background knowledge about how the world works, mostly by observation, a little bit by interaction, but mostly without supervision, mostly without reinforcement. So maybe that's the salvation, self-supervised learning. What is it? The, um, <coughs> the, basic concepts, the basic concept is I give you a piece of data, let's say a piece of video for the sake of uh, 
being concrete. And I'm going to mask a piece of that video, perhaps the second half of the video, uh, which is in blue at the top. And I'm going to train a machine uh, to predict the future of the video from the past and the present. Okay? Um, but the, the general concept of self-supervised learning is you have a piece of data, you mask a piece of it, and you ask the machine to predict the piece that is masked from the piece that is not masked. If the piece that is masked is always the same, it's always the future, for example, uh, you know, you can use a, some sort of prediction uh, architecture for that. Uh, but more often than not, you don't actually know which piece is going to be uh, masked. For example, in this scene here, right now you don't see my back, but you, can have, you might have some good idea that, you know, what it looks like. Uh, and, you know, maybe your brain sort of unconsciously tries, to, you know, is predicting what I look like from the back. And once I turn around, you know, your belief about this is updated, right? You can, you can train yourself, you can train your model. Uh, you know, same for all kinds of parts of the scene here, which are currently uh, occluded from your, from your view. So this principle of sort of uh, learning to predict things that you will eventually see, I think, is a, is a good one. Now, this is... Um, uh, so again, you could train yourself to predict the past from the present, to predict the top of the image from the bottom, you know, whatever. It doesn't, doesn't matter exactly what it is. Um, the advantage of this is that, uh, and this is, a, this is something that, you know, Jeff Hinton has claimed for a long time, is that the amount of information you're giving to the machine at every time step, at every uh, trial, at every sample, is enormous. You're asking to predict every pixel you know, in a bunch of frames in a video, which is a lot of information, much more than the label of, a, of an image, for example. Which means you're putting a lot more constraints on the parameters of the machine, which means you can train the machine to learn a lot of uh, knowledge with a relatively small number of samples. And furthermore, those samples are free because, you know, we have more video data than, than we can deal with. So essentially, if you think about sort of a, a hierarchy of uh, the type of loading paradigms that, that we, we've been talking about here, in self-supervised learning, uh, there's a, a huge amount of feedback you're giving to the machine. You know, you're giving it a piece of video and then you're asking it, you're telling it, you know, predict all those pixels. Uh, it's an enormous amount of information. Uh, there's a technical issue with it, which I'll come, back, I'll come to in a minute. Supervised learning, you give a relatively small amount of feedback. You, you tell the machine, this is class number three out of a thousand. It's not a huge amount of information. Um, and I should say right now, the, the reason why uh, neural nets work so well on ImageNet is not just that it has one million training samples, it's that it has 1,000 categories. Having a problem with lots of categories helps a lot to kind of construct good representations. Uh, and then reinforcement learning has a very, very weak feedback. You're only telling the machine once in a while you got it right or you got it wrong. You're gi giving just a scalar value. There's absolutely no way that a machine can learn anything complex without lots and lots of interactions using basic reinforcement learning. There's just no way. You're just not giving it a lot of information. It, you know, that's what, you know, learning theory, learning theory is called this sample complexity. And it's just completely obvious that there is no way you can learn complex stuff without tons and tons of interactions when you're giving just one scalar value once in a while as a feedback. So the path to human level intelligence, you know, might go through reinforcement learning, but it's not gonna be necessary. It's not gonna be sufficient, that's for sure. Uh, that led me to this uh, obnoxious analogy of intelligence uh, as a cake. And, you know, if self-supervised learning is the, the bulk of the cake, uh, machine learning is in the same embarrassing situation as physics uh, in the sense that physicists have no idea what 95% of the mass in the universe is. You know, it's dark matter and dark energy. They have no idea what it is. Uh, we only know the 5% that is actually real matter and energy, but the rest, we don't know what it is. So here it's the same thing. We can do, we can make the cherry, we can make the icing on the cake, but we, we can't actually bake the cake. Okay, so... Um, I gave you a preview earlier of what's missing, and what's missing is the ability to learn models, predictive models of the world. Um, you know, in the example of the car, you, if you want to train a system to drive a car, it has to have some sort of 
predictive model was going to happen so as not to try stupid things like running into a tree or off a cliff. So several years ago, a few of my uh, colleagues at uh, Facebook uh, ran this experiment, which they, you know, they, they sort of cooked up a bunch of simple physical situations where you stack a bunch of cubes and then you either run a game engine to kind of simulate the cubes falling or not falling, or you actually have real data where you take videos of a stack of cubes, and you train a, a video version of, of CompNet basically to predict what's gonna happen to the cubes. So what you see here is what actually happens. Uh, those are sort of segmentation maps of the various cubes, and this is what the CompNet is producing. And the predictions are kind of blurry. The reason why they're blurry is because there is no, uh, there's no way of exactly predicting what's going to happen. There is a little bit of uncertainty about where the cubes actually are and everything. Um, and so what the system produces is a prediction which is sort of an average of multiple futures that can happen. And that's a blurry prediction. So how to deal with uncertainty is going to become the, the, main, the main problem here. Right? We're going to make, we're going to predict uh, what's going to happen in the world by doing video prediction, or we're going to uh, take a, an image or a piece of text, mask so, some parts of it, and then ask a system to reconstruct. And there is no way to make those predictions exactly. And so what we have to have are systems that can deal with the uncertainty in the prediction. They can represent the uncertainty in the prediction. And it's for that reason that I'll introduce the notion of energy-based learning. So um, you can think of it as kind of a weaker form of, of learning that people are used to, which is sort of learning probabilistic models or learning densities, learning you know, distributions. And the reason that we have to weaken it is because um, in high-dimensional continuous spaces like images, we don't have good ways of representing uh, distributions that mean anything useful. So um, let's say our entire world consists of two scalar variables, y1 and y2. Uh, we're not going to do prediction here. I mean, we could consider that one variable is observed, the other one is not, but we don't know in advance which one. So let's say I observe y2, OK? And this is, this is our training set. Each, each, each point here is a, a training sample. And so there's obviously some structure in our world here. Uh, you know, all the values of y1, y2 seem to lie on some sort of uh, surface, a line, I mean, uh, here a curve. And if I give you a, a, a value of, uh, of y2, you can predict that the value of y1 will, will be sort of around here or around there. This is, this is 30? OK. I, I couldn't tell it was a, like a comma or not. OK, 30 minutes, that's perfect. Um, so, uh, Right, so there are multiple possible predictions. So if you train a neural net or whatever parameterized function to make one prediction of y2, of y1 as a function of y2, it's not gonna work because it can only predict one output. If you train the system with least square, when it sees half of the sample on this side, the other half on that side, what it's gonna produce is the mean of the two. Okay, that's the best way to minimize the squared error. That's not a good prediction for y1, for this value of y2. That's those blurry predictions I was showing you about. That's a blurry prediction here right in the middle. So how do we uh, kind of turn uh, uh, a prediction with sort of multiple possible outputs into kind of an architecture, if you want? And the proposal of energy-based models. So if you go, of course, if you're a probabilist, you say, well, you know, this is just a joint distribution. I'm just going to learn the density of the joint distribution uh, between those two variables, and I'm done. Yeah, you can do this in two dimensions. You can't do this in one million dimensions when the, those, those things represent natural images, for example. So uh, what I'm proposing is uh, we're going to learn an energy function. It's this energy function. So think of it as a, the negative log of a probability, but it's not going to be normalized. We're not going to care about normalization. Okay? So that in that way, it's a little more general than, uh, than, than probabilistic approaches. Uh, so give, if, if our data are those blue beads here, uh, an appropriate energy function that captures the dependency between the, the two variables um, is, looks something like this. It takes low energies on the, on the samples and higher energies outside. Okay? And if we have a system like this, if we have a, a function that has two inputs in this case, one output that gives us the, 
basically the compatibility between the two inputs, the, the two values that we give it. Uh, we can use it to predict. You know, I give you a value of y2, and then uh, by gradient descent, you can find, or by some search uh, uh, method, you can, you can find the two values that produce a low energy on the output, and they correspond to the two values of y1 that uh, are compatible with y2, okay? So that's, that's how inference works in those, in those systems. Um, the system doesn't produce an output, it only has inputs. And if I constrain the value of some of the inputs, I can compute the value of the other inputs that will minimize the energy using some, some scheme. So now the second question is, how do you train this box that produces that energy function? And the training will do things like shaping the energy function so that uh, it will take low energy on the, on the blue beads and higher energies outside. So if you have a parameterized function, say in the form of a neural net that produces a scalar output, it's very easy to show it a sample and then tune the parameter so the output goes down, right? So show it a sample, one of the blue beads, and then tweak the parameters of the neural net so that the output goes down so you get low energy for data points. Um, and now the second question is, how do you make sure the uh, energy is higher outside? Because if, it's, if this energy function is flat, it just gives you low value for everything. It doesn't play any interesting role. So you have to make sure the energy is higher outside of the, the region of, uh, of data. And this is something that uh, probabilistic model, give, you know, like maximum likelihood and normalized probabilistic model do automatically. And the way you transform an energy-based model into, uh, into a probabilistic one is, is, is through a Gibbs distribution. I mean, you have several ways, but that's kind of a very natural uh, one to do. So take your energy function and take the exponential minus, multiply by some arbitrary positive constant, and then normalize. So you get a bunch of numbers between 0 and 1 that sum to 1. Okay? In the discrete case, that's, that's called softmax. In the continuous case, it's, uh, it's called a Gibbs distribution. Um, in the general case where the energy function is complicated, this normalizing term, normalization term is intractable. You can't compute this integral. So you can't actually turn the energy into, uh, into a probability. And that's why I'm arguing for just manipulating the energy function, not going to a density, because you can't normalize it. You can only normalize when the energy is kind of a, has a trivial form and it's not that interesting. So, Right, so that's the, the problem of uh, energy-based learning. <coughs> uh, it's easy to make the energy low on the samples. It's higher to make it, it's, it's harder to make sure it's higher outside. <coughs> um, it's possible to reinterpret classic uh, learning algorithms in terms of uh, sort of energy <coughs> type models. Uh, you know, classic unsupervised algorithms like PCA or K-means or Gaston mixture model or square ICA, things like this. Those are two examples here for PCA and K-means. Uh, so this is in two dimensions. The variable has, is just a vector with two dimensions. Uh, and uh, the energy function for, uh, for K-means is, uh, for PCA, I'm sorry, is just the square reconstruction error. So you take a vector Y, multiple, you know, project it on the principal subspace, uh, which is done by this matrix uh, W and then multiply by W transpose, and assuming things are pr uh, appropriately normalized, you get a reconstruction of the uh, original point, which is just the, in the original space, the location of a projection of a point onto the, onto the, 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 the linear subspace, the principal subspace. So this is the principal subspace here in, in, in dark. And you take any point, you project it here, and the energy now, the reconstruction error, which is the distance between the original point and this projection, on the principal uh, uh, subspace. And so the, the grayscale here represent that uh, energy, okay? Uh, zero energy on the principal uh, subspace and energy that grows quadratic, quadratically as you move away. Obviously, this is not a good representation of that data manifold. This is the data, okay? So the data points are sampled from this spiral uh, and PCA doesn't do a good job at this, right? Uh, K-means has a funny kind of energy function, which is not uh, directly, uh, uh, doesn't have a, a sort of direct form, but it's the, it's the minimum of some more uh, elementary energy function uh, over some latent variable Z. And we'll come back to models of this type. So we have a 
energy function, which is a reconstruction error. So it's the square distance between the data point y and its reconstruction. And its reconstruction is the product of a prototype matrix where the columns are a bunch of prototypes multiplied by a z vector, which is a latent variable. And that z vector is constrained to be a one-hot vector. So it's a, a vector with all zeros, except it has a one at one location. And to measure the reconstruction error of a particular point, you figure out which uh, prototype is closest to it. And then the reconstruction error is the distance between uh, the data point and the reconstruction, and the, the, uh, the closest prototype, OK? So the minimizing with respect to the z vector will figure out which column of w, which is which prototype is closest to y. And that's the, that's the one that produces the lowest reconstruction error. And so now the energy function is defined as the minimum of a z, where z is a, a one, of, one of k code of this uh, energy function. Now, uh, when you plot this energy, where you train k-means on this data set, uh, where the data is sampled from this uh, uh, pink uh, spiral, and, uh, and you have, I think, 20, uh, 20 prototypes here, you get a whole bunch of um, potential wells, if you want. So they're quadratic uh, bowls energy uh, minima. And the overall energy is the minimum of all of those 20 quadratic balls. Uh, it looks really beautiful in two dimensions. It doesn't scale very well with in, in high dimension because um, you know, how do you populate a high dimensional space with prototypes? OK, so those are merely two examples of classical unsupervised link methods. But here, what I've done is list seven different classes of methods that ensure that the energy outside the region of, uh, of data is higher than on the region of data. Um, so I mentioned the one at the top, uh, build a machine so that the volume of low energy stuff is constant. And that's the case for PCA, for k-means, uh, Gaussian mixture model, square RCA, et cetera. Another one is you make your energy function very flexible. Uh, but you th think of it as the log of some probability, and you do maximum likelihood. So automatically, because your uh, probability distribution needs to be normalized, it's going to have the effect of pushing up the energy of stuff you don't observe. But it's very difficult because you get the log of this normalization term, the partition function, which is generally intractable. And so it's very hard to do this. So that's called uh, uh, maximum likelihood. And it's in when it's intractable, you have to use approximation, like variational approximations or or uh, Monte Carlo methods or Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. Another technique which is quite popular is you push down on the energy of data points and then you push up on chosen locations outside. And if you're familiar with GANs, generative adversarial networks, generative adversarial networks are a way of doing this. So think of the object you're training in a GAN as the discriminator, not the generator. The discriminator is the thing you're actually training. And when you think about the discriminator, it is an energy function. Okay, remove the exponential at the end of your, of your discriminator. It just produces a score. Think of this score as an energy that you're going to try to make large for bad samples and low for good samples. Okay, good for, you know, low for samples you observe and bad for samples you don't observe. And the question is, how do you generate bad samples whose energy you're going to push up? And the idea of GAN is that you train a neural net which from a bunch of random numbers is going to produce a bad sample whose energy you're going to push up. That's your generator. OK? So you can, and in fact, we have a paper on this called energy-based GANs. So it's kind of an interpretation of GANs in the context of energy-based models. Um, I'm not going to talk about the other ones, except, um, except those two. So this one, uh, denoising autoencoder, says, um, I'm not going to train the system to actually compute an energy function explicitly, but I'm going to train a dynamical system <coughs> to start from <coughs> a point outside the region of data. And then I'm going to train a neural net to map it back to the region of data. Okay, so I, I, I take a training sample. I corrupt it. So now I take a noisy training sample. And I train a neural net to map it back. So my reconstruction error now is the distance between the, the noisy sample and the original one. And so it's going to make the energy kind of be large outside the, the region of, of data. And I'll come back to this uh, a little more explicitly. But my favorite one is the last one. And that last one says, 
we're going to regularize uh, some parameter inside the network so that the volume of stuff that is properly reconstructed is low. Okay? So we're going to make the system pay for reconstructing too many things. And how to do this, I'll come, I'll come to this in a minute. <coughs> so if you are, if you're a probabilist uh, and you go through this, you do maximum likelihood, you have, uh, you know, you, you view your energy function as the unnormalized log of some probability distribution. So you go through the Gibbs distribution to turn it into a distribution, uh, into a, a, a normalized distribution. And now you have a bunch of data points. What you want to do is maximize the probability that your model gives to your data points. So the product of the probability that your model gives to the data point, or you want to minimize the negative log of the probability that your model gives to all the data points. And that's the, the uh, objective function you see here. So this is the negative log likelihood that you want of a data point. Uh, it's the negative log of the numerator, also divided by beta because it's easier, uh, minus the negative log of the denominator. Okay, but there's two minuses, so that gives us a plus. So that's the objective function you need to minimize if you are a probabilist. And this will have the effect of pushing down on the energy of the data points. And this will have the effect, if, to minimize this, you will have to push up on the energy of every single point in your space. Okay, because to make this small, you have to make those energies high, because it's negative exponential. <coughs> if you compute the gradient of that, uh, loss function with respect to the parameters of your energy function, uh, you get the expression at the top here, which uh, tells you that a step of gradient is going to push down with a unit force on the data point. And then the second term says, I'm going to push up on every point in the space with a force that's proportional to the probability that my model gives to that point. Okay, So points that have high probability are going to get pushed up really high. Uh, points that have low probability, which mean high energy, are going to push up. Uh, not as, not as hard. The integral of the force is 1. And so when the only data point that has high probability, which means low energy, is the correct one, then those two terms balance. And the thing kind of converges, if you want. Um, you can't actually compute this integral. So very often, you have to approximate it using Monte Carlo methods or variational approximations. And this is what a lot of people in sort of probabilistic modeling do. There's a lot of papers on this. But you don't need to do all this. OK, so now let's talk about latent variable models. So I, I talked about the k-means method where there is a z variable that you have to minimize over to get the energy of your, of your system. And it's kind of a specific example of a kind of more general um, approach. <clears throat> uh, ignore the stuff on the, on the right for now. Just look at the left side. So uh, you can either prefer the equations or the block diagram, depending on whether you are a mathematician, a computer scientist, or an engineer. Um, but let's look at the block diagram now. So uh, you have a data point y uh, that you want to reconstruct. And your energy function is going to be the reconstruction error. Uh, you're going to reconstruct this data point by running a latent variable through a decoder function. Um, think of it as a neural net. Uh, in the simplest case, it's just a, a simple matrix, W, called a dictionary matrix. And then you compute the, the squared error. So in this case, the C uh, cost function here is just a squared error between the data point and the multiplication of a matrix by a latent vector. OK, this is like k means, except we don't constrain this vector to be 1 of k. Um, and there's a problem with this. If you just use this, Without anything else, if z has the same dimension as y or bigger, or even slightly smaller, there's always going to be a y that's going to reconstruct any, there's always going to be a z that is going to perfectly reconstruct any y you throw at it. Okay? For a non degenerate version of the decoder, non degenerate matrix here, there's always going to be a z that exactly reconstructed the y. And that's not good because that means every point in your y space is going to be exactly reconstructed. Your energy function is going to be flat, equal to zero everywhere. So the question now is, how do you make sure the energy is high on points that you don't train on? And this R of Z here is a regularizer that is going to make you pay for choosing a Z that's outside of kind of a small volume, if you want. OK? Uh, and the usual trick, something that Julien Meral has worked on a lot, is uh, 
sparse coding. So in sparse coding, uh, the, the regularizer is just the L1 norm of Z. So it's the sum of the absolute values of the components of Z. And the effect of this is uh, basically to uh, make the machine want to make many components of Z zero, which is why it's called sparse coding. It's you're trying to reconstruct a data point Y as uh, the product of a sparse vector with lots of zeros in it multiplied by a matrix. Okay. So assuming W is known, I give you a Y, you find a Z that minimizes the sum of those two terms. It's going to give you a Z vector that is sparse, that's got lots of zeros. Okay. And the re region of space that have low energy are the ones, uh, you know, basically that uh, energy, once you minimize with respect to Z, uh, is the energy of every data point. And because Z is constrained to be sparse, uh, it's going to be a small region of space that takes low energy, and outside it's going to be high energy. Okay? So by adjusting the alpha coefficient here, you can make the, the region of space that is properly reconstructed as small as you want or, or larger if you want. <coughs> and the general form is something like this. E of yz equals some cost function that measures the discrepancy between the data point and the decoder function applied to z. The decoder function is trainable, and then you have a regularizer that limits the information content, essentially, of z. K-means does this implicitly by restricting z to be a discrete variable. OK? Uh, PCA or things similar to this implicitly do this by limiting the dimension of z. Uh, ignore the bottom for now. So if you apply sparse coding to this little uh, spiral data set, this is the energy function you get. Uh, so every line that you, you, can, uh, you can sort of see here is a different linear subspace, which is actually the selection of a different column or pair of columns of uh, the W matrix. Um, and and the, the whole thing kind of fits the, fits the data, right? Because the system is trained to just minimize the reconstruction error plus the regularizer on the data points. And because it's got this regularizer, as a consequence, it gives high energy to stuff that is outside. You apply this to MNIST, you get things like this. So these are the columns of the W matrix. And uh, what sparse coding does in this case is that it uh, reconstructs every digit in MNIST as a linear combination of a small number of those guys. Okay, because only a small number of components of Z can be non-zero, so a small number of columns will be selected. And so every digit is going to be reconstructed as a linear combination of a small number of those. You train the W matrix here in sparse coding, but just with gradient descent. Uh, you have to play a trick, which is that you have co to constrain the norm of those vectors to be within a sphere, like less than one, for example. Uh, otherwise, they blow up and the Z variable shrinks, but that's not really interesting. It's kind of a degenerate solution. So you have to constrain the, th those vectors, the columns of W, to be small, to be bounded. Um, and as a result, when you train the system, the the system identifies those pieces that need to be combined to form characters as kind of small pieces of strokes, which is kind of a logical way of decomposing a character into elementary components. So my colleagues at uh, Facebook recently used uh, one of those latent variable uh, system where they kind of limited the information content of the latent representation by kind of making it low dimensional. Uh, they call that GLOW, Generation Through Latent Optimization. This is by Bojanowski, Julien, Lopez Paz, and Schlamm. Um, and if you train on uh, uh, faces, for example, you get you know, reconstruction of faces like this with you know, relatively low dimensional uh, um, uh, latent vectors. And um, you can sort of interpolate in that latent space and sort of interpolate from you know, one face to another. This is you know, not as, I mean, this is a few years old, but, you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, at the time, similar to the, the, the GANs of the time. Uh, there's been a lot of progress in GANs. Um, not so much in this particular approach, but, um, but it, it's kind of an interesting uh, way of approaching the problem. Now, there's, a, there's an issue with uh, sparse coding, which is that if I give you a Y, you have to run an optimization algorithm to find the optimal Z that minimizes the energy. And that might be a little expensive even if you use uh, Julien's code, uh, it's called SPAMS, um, it's still a little expensive. So 
here's a trick. And the trick is you're not going to make the z variable uh, a latent variable that you have to optimize over. You're just going to make the output of an encoder. So you're going to train a neural net here to predict what the optimal code is for sparse coding. And that's called a sparse autoencoder. So you have uh, a piece of data here. You're running to an encoder. It predicts the value of uh, a variable. This variable is regularized to be sparse through this R of Z, which could be an L1 norm. And then you reconstruct the, the outputs. And this is, in a general form, a regularized autoencoder in this uh, particular form of an L1 regularizer that's called a sparse autoencoder. <coughs> now, there's two forms of it, uh, a form where it's just a neural net with an additional term in the, in the objective function for training. There's another form. Uh, where you still have z as, as a latent variable, but now you have a third term in the energy that uh, makes you pay for making z too different from the output of the encoder. And so the procedure is you give it a y. By grid and descent, you find the z that minimizes the sum of three terms, the reconstruction error, the regularizer, and the prediction error here, which is the distance from z to the output of the encoder, which is a, a prediction of z, if you want. Then once you have that z, you do one step of gradient descent in the parameters of the encoder of the decoder. So the decoder tries to get its output to get closer to y, and the encoder get, tries to get its output z bar to get closer to z by minimizing this. Okay. And uh, there's a couple of papers on this that are about 10 years old. Uh, we used to call this predictive sparse decomposition. Uh, there's a form of it called LISTA. So if you run this algorithm on natural image patches, this is the learning algorithm actually running. Uh, and you start with random. Um, so what you see here, each square is one column of uh, the W matrix in the encoder, I believe, here. Um, but there is a similar one in the decoder, which looks very similar. And as learning proceeds, as you train on more and more uh, natural image patches, what you see is a, a pattern of kind of features ex uh, uh, appearing. Uh, they end up being oriented, edge, uh, oriented contour detectors, if you want, something like this. There's a convolutional form of this where the reconstruction now uh, consists in taking a bunch of feature maps, those are your latent variables, convolving it with a bunch of kernels, summing up the results, and that's your reconstruction. Okay? So instead of having scalar here, you have feature maps. And instead of having uh, uh, columns of a matrix, you have uh, convolutional uh, kernels. And you get really cool filters. Um, so those are the decoder filters. These are the encoder filters for various number of uh, various dimensions of the, of the code here. And so you get these little natural features emerging completely un, you know, unsupervised from training on natural image patches. Let me skip ahead a little bit. Um, OK, so there is a, a formulation. You probably heard the uh, concept of variational autoencoder. And when you look at those papers, there's a whole bunch of um, you know, sort of variational bounds and uh, all that stuff. And it's very hard to understand intuitively what's going on. So I'm going to kind of formulate this in the context of this energy-based uh, regularized autoencoder model, what a variational autoencoder is. And uh, I'm sure for you it's going to be enlightening if you haven't completely understood already what a variational autoencoder is. Um, so, so variational autoencoder is an autoencoder. You fit it to data, a, a piece of data, image patch or whatever, running through an encoder. You predict a code, and then you add noise to that code in a particular way. You add Gaussian noise to that code. And then you run through a decoder, and you have a reconstruction error, and you minimize the reconstruction error by training this entire system. Now, OK, so in the space of codes, in the Z space, Every training sample is going to be a point, OK? And perhaps there's going to be some sort of structure to that, to those, to those points. You don't know. If you add noise to each of those points, which is what the virtual encoder does, you turn every single one of those points into a fuzzy ball, right? So you have a fuzzy sphere around every point. Now, here's the problem. If you give this data point, and then you add noise, and it, the noise puts it here. When you reconstruct, the system is going to think it was that point. And so the reconstruction error is not going to be very good because it's going to confuse one, uh, you know, one data point with another one. So when you train the system, the consequence of 
of this noise is that all of those fuzzy balls are going to fly away from each other. Okay, they're going to try to get as far from each other as possible to minimize the confusion. <coughs> and that doesn't help you. It just makes the weights of the encoder larger, but doesn't really help you. So to prevent this from happening, you're going to attach every, every single one of those spheres with a spring attached to the center. Okay? So you tell the spheres, you can't go too far. You know, you pay a price for going too far. And so the system is going to try to find a trade-off between, uh, you know, pushing the, the balls far away from each other, but not being able to do this is going to merge or, or let some of the spheres interpenetrate as long as the reconstruction error that this causes is not too high. And so in the end, it's going to try to find some sort of structure in the latent space that will sort of organize those points so that they, you know, basically um, capture the structure of the data. And you can think of this as just another way of limiting the information content of the code. So our regularizer R of Z with sparse coding was limiting the information content of the code. This is another way of limiting the information content of the code. You can do it by imposing low dimension, sparsity, various other ways of this type, or you can impose it by adding noise as long as you limit the norm of the, of the points. Now, it's a bit more formalized in, uh, in variational autoencoder where the size of, this, of those balls is, is not fixed. It can actually vary in all dimensions, but there is a cost function that makes, it, makes you pay for making it significantly smaller than one. Uh, and there's another term that makes sure the average, the mean of all those points is actually centered on zero, uh, which is not, with the, the spring analogy, doesn't quite, quite, uh, quite do. Um, Denoising autoencoder is this idea where you, you take uh, input data, you corrupt it, you run it through an autoencoder, and you reconstruct the original uh, point without corruption. And so visually, it looks like this, where uh, this would be the data point. Every, uh, every one of those points is, a, uh, is a, a corrupted training sample, if you want. So it's still the, the, the spiral example. And then you train a neural net to take, you know, you, you take a data point, you corrupt it, and then you train a neural net to map from this to here. This is the input, this is the desired output. Very simple. You train this neural net, and then what you can plot is the blue points here are the output of that autoencoder neural net for every one of those uh, golden points, whatever, right? So. I don't know, this one maps to here, and this one to there, this one to here, et cetera. So you see that the system has kind of learned, really. Um, it's kind of similar representation here, but you take every grid point, in the sp every point on the grid in the space, and the blue points are the image of every single one of those points, and they primarily cluster around the, the region of high data density, which is what you want. The energy function is just the square reconstruction error between, the, uh, between every point in the space and the point that it maps to. And those little vectors here kind of indicate the displacement, if you want. Uh, and the color indicates the energy function. There's an issue, which is that the energy is actually zero on this. Uh, this is not a ridge. It's actually a valley, and it's terrible. Okay, So this is a, it's a flaw of denoising autoencoder. It can create valleys in places that you shouldn't have one. But it works really well. For NLP, so some of you may probably have heard of BERT. Okay, it's going to take on the world by storm in NLP, and BERT is a special case of denoising autoencoder, where you give it a piece of text, uh, a window of a few hundred words, and I know I'm out of time. Um, a window of a few hundred words. You mask, so the the corruption consists in masking some of the words in that sentence or in that piece of text, typically 15% of the words. And then you train a giant neural net, a transformer neural net, which I'm not going to go into the explanation of, uh, of basically predicting the words that are missing. Um, and there, it's easy to handle the uncertainty in the prediction because at the output, you have a big softmax that gives you a probability distribution over all words in your dictionary. So here, you don't have the issue that you have with predicting video, where it's a high-dimensional continuous space. It's easy to handle uncertainty in discrete space, which is why it works well in this case. Um, so you train the system to do reconstruction on tons of text, billions of uh, segments of text. And in the end, you use the internal representation learned by the network as input to a, to a downstream supervised task, uh, like you know, uh, natural language inference, parsing, Winograd schema, 
uh, all kinds of stuff. And this beats the record on just about, you know, all the, the benchmarks and the, the glue. So glue is, uh, and super glue are, are a set of benchmarks in natural language understanding. And uh, the system is based on Bert. Uh, the latest one is Roberta from Facebook. Actually has the, the record. I think a few days ago, Microsoft came up with an improvement on Roberta that actually kind of brought the performance a little better. Uh, it works really well. It doesn't work on images. So if you use the same trick on images, you block a piece of the image and you ask the system to reconstruct, it doesn't quite work. It doesn't give you features that are very useful in the end for, uh, for vision. Um, let's see, I'm gonna stop here. Okay, I just wanna, wanna show you a, sim a simple uh, uh, example of prediction under uncertainty that, that's, that's uh, interesting. And it's uh, an example of training one of those predictive models to be uh, a forward model for a control problem of driving a car, for example. So if you drive a car, you might want to be able to predict what the cars around you are gonna do. Uh, and it's not deterministic. So if you are, uh, if you are this guy, you are this car, these are all the cars around you. This is a little rectangle extracted around, around yourself. And it might be useful to predict what the cars around you are gonna do if you wanna plan a, a kind of trajectory that will avoid you know, the probability of future um, uh, accidents. So one thing you can do is uh, something like this where you take a few frames so you, you are the blue car, the green cars are cars around you. You're observing the world doing some stuff around you. Uh, what you're gonna train is one of those predicting uh, model, a, a big convolutional net with some latent variable to predict the next frame. Um, and the precise, uh, I'm not gonna go into the details of the precise architecture. It's basically very similar to a VAE in this case where uh, you get the state of the world, which is the, uh, the environment of the car. You run into a couple, you know, a few layers of a conv net. You add uh, a latent variable here, uh, which goes through another couple layers of a, of a neural net. This latent variable is relatively low, low dimensional. And then you run through a decoder to predict the next frame. And to predict the value of the latent variable, uh, there's actually an encoder. And of course, the system could cheat because now it has the answer of the target. And so it could just use the value of the target to predict the latent variable. That wouldn't be very useful. So you have to restrict the information content in that latent variable because this looks like an autoencoder. Um, and you do this by adding noise, VAE style, uh, essentially. Uh, skipping details, so what you get here is, this is the kind of prediction you get if you don't use the latent variable, you set it to zero all the time. You get deterministic predictions, but they become blurry very quickly after a while. And those are multiple predictions that you get by making different samples of the latent variables, right? So you get different futures by uh, getting different samples of the latent variable. You can use this uh, type of uh, model as a forward model in a control system where you have the state of the world, the action you take, whether you turn the wheel, whether you accelerate or brake, you run this through your forward model, it gives you the next state. It takes a, a random sample from the latent variable to make that prediction. You can run this multiple time steps. Uh, there's a cost function that measures if the car is in lane, if it's too close to other cars, it's differentiable. So by backpropagation, you can propagate gradient to this entire thing and train another neural net called a policy network to figure out what is the best action I should take so as to minimize the expected value of the cost. And it's, a, it's not reinforcement learning, it's all differentiable. Um, so it's just backprop, okay? No, no reinforcement there. Uh, if you do this, it doesn't work very well. You have to regularize the system by making sure it stays in regions of the space where the forward model does a good prediction, which I'm not gonna go into the details of. And then after you do this, you run the, the policy network, so there's no planning necessary in the end. The policy network has already kind of thought in its mind when it was training all the bad things that could happen. And this is the, the blue car here is driving itself in traffic, and you have to realize that the traffic doesn't realize the, car, the blue car is here. It doesn't see it. Uh, here's maybe a better uh, example here. So the yellow car is a real car, the blue car started at the same location, but decided to do something else. So this is the one that we drive. And here it's getting squeezed, so it's, it's gonna, it has to escape because it's, not being, it's invisible to the other cars. So um, it's like a James Bond movie or something. Um, 
And uh, I'm going to stop here and thank you for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.